some of the diseases that affect the kidney and some of the areas that are ripe for future uh, research. So this slide uh, shows where the kidneys are in a normal human. Uh, as you can see, um, the kidneys are in the upper part of the abdomen and they're actually more towards the back. Uh, that's why sometimes you might hear about, you know, someone getting punched in the upper back and they go, oh, you, my kidneys hurt. Um, so the kidneys are about a third of a pound and we have two of them. And some people say, well, why do we need two? We don't have two hearts. We don't have two livers. And uh, it's not clear why we have two. And the reason I say that is because we can live with one. If I take out a kidney, uh, we see that, for instance, in people who donate kidneys. The other kidney functions. Initially, we have 50% of the original function if we took out one. But what happens is the remaining kidney actually grows. Uh, it gets bigger. And after about a year, it can reach about 85% of the original function of the two kidneys because, because of its increase in size. Somehow the kidney knows that it needs to, to grow. And there actually have been studies done in rats where they implant a third kidney. And what happens is the other two kidneys shrink. So somehow the body knows what the total function uh, should be. So we can live with one kidney. Now, what happens as we age is we all have a normal decline in kidney function, and this isn't well known. So your kidney function, when you're 50 years old, shown here, so here's all the ages on the bottom part going from 50 to 95, and on the y-axis is the function. We have two colors because the blue is men and the red is women. We have three lines because the middle line is sort of the average, and then the upper and lower lines are the range that we would see. But if you just look at that middle line, you see that at age 50, the function is near, let's say, 100. But as we age, that number decreases so that when you're 90, the function is getting closer to 60. You've lost about 40% of your kidney function. So when we're assessing patients in the clinic, we always have to assess their current kidney function not by some ideal number of 100, but, but what we compare it to what it should be for their age. And a lot of doctors don't realize that. So oftentimes they'll get an 80 year old with let's say a kidney function of 70 and they'll go, oh, that person has impaired kidney function. Uh, they have to be worked up and that's not true. Uh, so a lot of people are overdiagnosed with kidney disease when it's just a normal decrease with age. Now, you might ask yourself, why does the function decrease with age? And this is currently uh, under investigation. It's not, it's not well understood. And it's important because if we could prevent the normal decline with age, then when people do get kidney problems who are in the geriatric age group, they would start with a higher kidney function than they start normally. So, if someone's 50 and they get kidney disease, their function might drop, let's say to 40. But if someone's starting already at 60, then their function's gonna drop a lot more to a lower number than had they started at a higher number. So it's important um, for the public to know and for doctors to know that the normality, the so-called normality of what kidney function is, is not an absolute number, it's age dependent. Now, when we look at the function of the kidneys, what has evolved over the last number of years is to look at what are called different stages of, of disease. So the stages are numbered one, two, three, four, and five. One is normal. Five is the worst, and they're called CKD stages. CKD stands for chronic kidney disease. And so as the kidney function declines from over 90 down to let's say 15, you go to different stages. And so 
depending on what the function is, the doctor will say your CKD stage four or your CKD stage five. People with CKD stage five have about 15% of their kidney function left and they're getting close to needing dialysis. So, you, so the kidney function, depending on what the disease is, can decline to certain levels and puts you in a certain CKD stage. And people can jump from one stage to the other also. Normally, you don't get better. Normally, you get worse. So when you, let's say, get a disease, whatever it happens to be, and you go to CKD stage three, the doctor will continue to follow you quite closely and try to put you on pills to prevent you from going from stage three to four and then four to five. Now, some people will just stay at stage three after getting a kidney disease for the rest of their life. It won't keep getting worse and worse. Other people, they go to a higher and higher stage, which means the kidney function is declining. Now, what does the kidney do? First of all, the kidney if you look under the microscope, has components that are called nephrons. Each kidney has 1 million nephrons, so they're very, very small. The nephron is composed of two different types of functions, functional units. The first part, called the glomerulus, is a filter, like a filter in your bathtub or a filter that you purify air with or how you filter water. The next part, doesn't filter. It actually takes what came through the filter and changes the substances in it. Like it'll change the amount of water, it'll change the amount of salt, it'll change the amount of potassium. There are cells along the length of this nephron that do very many things. Ultimately, when it gets down to the end, that's the final urine. Now we have a million of these all joining up. I'm only showing you one. So all of these make urine and then all of them join up. And eventually the urine comes out, but actually each kidney has a million different functioning units called nephrons made of a filter. And then the rest of the nephron that changes what's in the fluid here. Ultimately what the kidney essentially does is it keeps the chemistry of your blood constant. Now, why does the chemistry of your blood ever change? Why do you need a kidney? Why do you need some organ to keep the chemistry of your blood constant, to get rid of waste and this kind of thing? It's because we eat. Every time we eat, we significantly change the chemistry of our blood. We don't think about it. And if that chemistry was allowed to change from what we eat and nothing was done about it, you wouldn't live very long. So we need some sort of organ that recognizes what the change in the chemistry was and then return the chemistry to normal. And that's what the kidney does. And the kidney is able to do this until the function gets down to about 15% of normal. We have a big leeway. If your kidneys are functioning 50% of normal, you're still fine. 30% of normal, you're still fine. But once the function gets down to about 15%, the kidney is no longer able to keep the chemistry of your blood constant. And that's when we have to start thinking of replacing the kidney function with either dialysis or a transplant, that sort of thing. But if someone says to you, what does the kidney do? The correct answer is it keeps the blood chemistry normal. Now the kidneys have multiple functions because the chemistry of the blood is complicated. So they have to regulate many things in the blood. One of them is potassium. The kidneys are extremely important for getting rid of all the potassium you eat daily. There's potassium in bananas, there's potassium in oranges, there's potassium in watermelon, there's potassium in meat and fish. Every time we eat, we can change the potassium in our blood and that cannot be allowed to occur. Why? because potassium is very important for the electricity in our heart. And if potassium in your blood goes up because you ate five bananas tonight, your heart can get very irregular in its beating. It can even stop. So the potassium in the blood is kept within a very narrow range, despite marked increases in how much potassium is being put into the system from your diet, 
because the kidneys recognize it and they get rid of potassium in, their, in your urine such that the blood potassium is kept normal. The kidney also gets rid of nitrogen waste. Every time we eat protein, yogurt, eggs, fish, meat, soy, we put nitrogen into our blood, nitrogen containing compounds. This cannot be allowed to occur excessively or we will get very, very sick. The kidney recognizes this and it gets rid of the nitrogen in the form of a chemical called urea. All the nitrogen that comes in in different forms from your diet is turned into one chemical called urea in your liver and the kidney gets rid of the urea. The kidney also is essential for controlling your blood pressure. It controls the blood pressure indirectly by controlling the amount of salt and water that you get rid of. When you take in too much salt, your blood pressure goes up. In fact, you can make your blood pressure whatever you want just by taking in different amounts of salt. And your water intake is also important for affecting your blood pressure. And so the kidney, when you, let's say, pour salt all over your food, recognizes that the salt changed in the blood and will get rid of the salt that you ate so that your, the salt in your, in your body and in your blood stays the same, therefore, thereby preventing your blood pressure from going up. Now, 45% of Americans age 18 and older actually have high blood pressure, which is now defined as 130 over 80. Anything that or more is high blood pressure. And there's a problem because people don't measure their blood pressure. People don't feel anything usually when their blood pressure is high. So it's a silent problem. And my recommendation to everybody over 20 or 30 is to measure your blood pressure at least once a week so that you know what it, what it is. Because it's a, it, it leads to problems. The blood pressure itself isn't a problem. It's that the blood pressure affects your organs. The blood pressure can affect your brain. You can get a stroke. The blood pressure can affect your heart and your heart starts, stops functioning as efficiently. Um, some people think the, the blood, high blood pressure can also affect the kidneys. So there's an, so-called end organ damage from having a high blood pressure. And the sad thing is it's very easy to treat. We have fantastic pills, a whole array of different types of pills to keep the blood pressure normal. And so it's a shame that people ignore it. Even people with high blood pressure, you tell them to get a blood pressure cuff, they, they're not interested. Um, now, the important thing to know is that the blood pressure that you get in the doctor's office is often higher than it is normally at home because of what's called white coat syndrome. When people go to the doctor's office, they're all anxious, they're nervous, and their blood pressure is higher. So we never go by what the nurse told us the blood pressure is in the office. We always tell the patient, get the blood pressure at home That's and bring the blood pressure into our office, the numbers you're getting. That's the number we go by. You're not as anxious and we, it more reflects your real blood pressure. Now, the important thing to realize is the normal blood pressure fluctuates throughout the day. And it's not a random fluctuation. The blood pressure tends to be highest around four, five, six, seven, eight in the morning. And then throughout the day starts getting a lower again, but starts climbing in the middle of the night. In, in most humans, it's, it's, so, it's a so-called diurnal variation. So your blood pressure is dependent on when you measured it. So we tell people, get your pressure in the morning, afternoon, at night. And we don't expect it to be the same. It will be different, but it's normally different. And people who have high blood pressure can either have all three measurements higher, or they might find that the process causing high blood pressure is only causing the morning blood pressure high. So they might come in and they have normal blood pressure in the afternoon and at night, but every morning it's high. That's important for us to know because that determines how we're going to give the pills. The pills have a delay. When I give you a blood pressure pill, it doesn't work right away. So if you tell me that your blood pressure is high first thing in the morning, it's of no use for me to tell you to take the pill at breakfast because it's going to take you know four hours to start working, three, four hours. If I know your blood pressure is high in the morning, I'm going to tell you to take the blood pressure pill before you go to bed. So we need to know when your blood pressure is high so we can time when we're going to give you the pill. For instance, if someone's pressure is high in the morning and in the evening, we'll tell them to take a pill in the morning. 
that will take care of the evening, but high blood pressure. And we tell them to take a pill in the evening, that'll take care of the next morning's high blood pressure. Um, so that's important. The other thing that's important to know is that blood pressure varies with posture. When you're lying, your blood pressure is the highest. When you're sitting, it's lower. And when you're standing, it's even lower. So it really depends how you're measuring your blood pressure. We tell everybody do it the same all the time. If you're going to do, if you like doing it standing, always do it standing. Now, sometimes in certain diseases, we need to get it sitting or lying and standing. We're looking for the drop when you stand. Some people, some elderly people have an excessive drop when they stand and they can faint. Um, but in general, we tell them you like doing it lying, always do it lying. So that's very important to know. And we also tell them, get a number of them. So if someone has high blood pressure, for instance, and we just started to treat them, we'll tell them every day, get your pressure two or three times a day, keep it in an Excel spreadsheet or in a book uh, and bring it in when you come into the doctor's office or call, call in your pressures. If, you know, if someone's just starting a new pill and which takes a few weeks till we get everything regulated and everything where we like it. There are another group of patients that just stop taking their pills. They're non-compliant because they never feel anything. So blood pressure is something that is very common, is very easy to treat, and you just have to know some of these subtleties in order to get your blood pressure for, for your whole life within the normal range. Now, the other thing I want to mention is it's a bit confusing because what evolved over the last 50 years is different types of specialists look after blood pressure. So there are generalist primary care doctors that look after easy to control blood pressure. If it gets a bit higher and harder to control, they'll refer you. And they may refer you to a cardiologist. Sometimes they refer you to an endocrinologist. Sometimes they refer you to a nephrologist. So oftentimes we're, we're you know, the patients um, have gone to different doctors, different subspecialists, and they each have sort of different approaches as far as the pills. But usually it's either a cardiologist or a nephrologist. Now, the kidney also prevents you from becoming anemic. That's another function the kidney has because the kidney makes a hormone that's called erythropoietin. And this hormone, once it leaves the kidney, gets into the blood and goes to your bones. The bones are where your red blood cells are made. That's part of what the bone marrow, that's what, what part of what the bone marrow does. So the erythropoietin goes to these cells and says to the bone marrow, make more red blood cells. But when your kidney is diseased, you don't have enough of this hormone. And so you don't have enough of the bone making red blood cells. And that's what anemia is, when you don't have enough red blood cells. So the doctor has to give you the hormone artificially. The kidney is also essential for controlling the health of your skeleton, bones, calcium, and phosphorus. Without the kidney functioning normally, you don't have normal bones. You can become osteoporotic and the bones don't have enough calcium. We know about this often because a lot of women, once they reach 60 or 70, are taking Tums to keep their bones healthier. Well, the kidney controls the amount of calcium in your body and in your bones because it makes another hormone it's not called erythropoietin that prevents anemia. It's called 125 vitamin D. 125 vitamin D is the vitamin D that actually works. The vitamin D you take from the pharmacy or that you take as a pill is not active. It has to be, that's 25 vitamin D that you buy in the pharmacy. It's converted in the kidney into something called 125 vitamin D. And it's the 125 that actually does the work on your skeleton and keeps your bones uh, healthy. But if the kidney is not working, it can't convert the 25 vitamin D that you're taking. It, you know, most people take a thousand units or 2000 units a day. It can't convert that into 125 vitamin D. And so we have to give patients with severe kidney disease, either a lot of 25 vitamin D, or we give them the active form 125 vitamin D. If we don't do that, we risk their bones becoming extremely weak and unhealthy. Now, 
when you get kidney disease, for whatever reason, you, you have certain things occurring to your body that can be a clue to the doctor that you have kidney disease. And it's really a result of all the things that don't function normally that the kidney does. So as I said, the kidney gets rid of salt and water. Well, you can imagine if your kidney function declines severely, all the salt and water that you're taking in from your diet is not going to come out in the urine and it's going to stay in your body and you're going to start getting swollen everywhere. And usually the swelling starts in the feet just because of gravity, because people are standing all day. When you have fluid overload, the feet are the first clue assuming you're standing. And then what happens is when you lie down at night and sleep, first thing in the morning, you notice, hey, my feet aren't swollen anymore. Why is that? Well, the fluid actually left your body into the urine. But during the day again, it starts accumulating in the feet as you're standing. When the kidney doesn't work well, you also feel nauseous and you lose your appetite. You just don't feel like eating and you don't, you don't want to see food. Why that is, is not clear. So a lot of people with kidney disease, they tell the doctor, I feel nauseous, I've lost my appetite. They start looking for an ulcer or they start looking for something in the stomach. They don't think that maybe it's the kidney. They don't put, that it doesn't occur to them. High blood pressure because the kidney can't regulate your blood pressure, as I mentioned. Then there are other things called electrolyte disorders. Electrolytes are things like sodium, potassium. You may have heard of those from Gatorade. Then there's calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, bicarbonate. These are all symbols for these different chemicals. Well, the kidney regulates all those things and makes sure that your blood chemistry of these electrolytes is normal. You get anemic because the kidney can't make erythropoiet. A number of people get depressed. It's not clear why that is. It's not necessarily only because they have kidney disease and they feel their life has significantly changed. The depression may be on a chemical basis too from the kidney not regulating the chemistry of the blood normally, it's not clear. People get sleep disturbances where they can't sleep at night and then sleep intermittently during the day. Their sleep is off. And they find that th things just don't, not only are they nauseous and they don't have an appetite, but the food itself doesn't taste like it normally does. They, they, lose the, they, they lose the ability to get a, a nice normal taste from the food. Everything tastes very bland. Now, how do we test for kidney diseases? There are blood tests and there are urine tests. I'm going to now talk about the most important blood test. And this is a very routine blood test. It's measured thousands of times a day at UCLA in the different clinics and hospitals. It's part of the regular blood test. You don't have to specify, I want this test measured. And the measure, the chemical is called creatinine. Creatinine is a chemical that the kidneys get rid of. And it's been used for 50 or 60 years to assess the function of the kidney that assesses the filter. It doesn't assess your ability to get rid of potassium and salt and water. It doesn't assess the ability to get rid of nitrogen. It doesn't test the erythropoietin hormone to prevent anemia. It doesn't test 125 vitamin D. It just tests how much the kidneys can filter your blood. The reason it's so important is because of all the functions I mentioned, the ability of the kidneys to filter your blood is the parameter that we use to determine whether someone needs dialysis. So we assess whether they need dialysis, not based on whether they're anemic, only not based on the 125 vitamin D, not based, but what is the filtration capability of their kidney? And that we assess from this very nice test called creatinine, just a blood test. If your creatinine is one or close to 1, 0.9, 1, then you have normal kidney filtration, normal kidney. If your creatinine is two, you've lost half your kidney filtration. If your creatinine is four, you've lost 75% of it and you only have 25% left. So you can see from this that if the creatinine gets to like six or seven, you're now at roughly 15, 12, 15%, which is where we start thinking you're gonna need dialysis unless there's something treatable. If we think it's permanent, then we can't leave you at 12, 15%. If we leave you at 12, 15%, your feet are gonna to start to swell. You're gonna start getting nauseous. You're gonna lose your appetite. 
the food is going to taste bland, your blood pressure is going to go up, you're going to get anemic, your bones are going to get worse, all these kind of things will happen. Now, in addition to testing the creatinine, we also check the urine and we do a number of things in the urine. The first is we check something called protein in the urine and we have a little stick that we stick in the urine that you can see here. It has a bunch of various colored bands and the more protein in the urine reflects a certain band that we look up on the bottle. So the, if, there, if there's nothing there, it really won't change color. And the more protein there is, we get more and more color. And we can look up on the bottle what that pattern means and tells us roughly how much protein there is in the urine. It's, in, it's not accurate, but it's, it's, a, it's a rough idea. The other thing we do is we actually can send the urine to the lab to tell us exactly how much protein there is there. Now, the reason we care is, again, this is an assessment of the filter. That filter doesn't just filter. It also prevents protein from getting into the rest of the nephron. The protein is kept in your blood. But if the filter is not functioning properly, not only does the, is there less filtration of water, but there's the opposite that occurs with protein. Too much protein, too much protein can get into the urine and that's not good. So if the filters are damaged, they leak a lot of protein. Normally we see hardly any protein in the urine at all. Now, this you see the foam here? It's a clue the patient may have protein in the urine because the urine is very foamy. Now, the most common cause of foamy urine is the person peed from too high up and created a bunch of bubbles. But if you're peeing near the toilet water and you have a lot of foam, that's a clue that you may have protein in the urine. Now, the other thing we look at is a change in the color of the urine. And there's many different colors. There's diseases that make the urine green, blue, red, we, we, and nephrologists know all these things. But the one we care about mostly is whether it's pink or red. Because if it's pink or red, we're immediately thinking like the patient is, that there's blood in the urine. Now, the most common cause of pink or red urine is someone ate beets the night before. So oftentimes, you know, we'll get a phone call or someone will come to the clinic, doctor, my urine turned red. And our first question is, did you have beets last night? And they go, oh yeah, come to think of it, I did. So there's a, a, there's a, a color in beets that gets filtered through the, through the filter of the kidney like creatinine does, and it just comes out in the urine, but it doesn't last long. We also, you know, grade the, the amount of redness. Obviously this second one here is lighter, even if it looks normal, like the first one here, there still could be blood in the urine, blood cells in the urine, and we look under the microscope. If, and we can see sometimes a lot of red blood cells in the urine, but it's not enough to turn the urine grossly red. So if we see blood in the urine and we can't see it with our eye, but we see it under the microscope, we call that microscopic blood in the urine my, or microscopic hematuria is the technical term. Whereas we call the red one here gross hematuria. And there are diseases that damage the filter such that blood comes through the filter. Normally you never have blood in your urine. You don't have protein in your urine, you don't have blood in your urine. But with a damaged filter, it leaks through. The other thing that can happen is you can get a urinary tract infection. Women who are sexually active in their 20s are probably the most frequent patients that we see. Um, but you know, anyone can get urinary tract infections. Women tend to get urinary tract infections more commonly because the opening to the outside world is so close to the urinary tract, whereas with men, it, it's obviously a longer route. So the, the urethra is protected. If we suspect uh, blood and bacteria in the urine, we will look under the microscope, which is what you see here on the right. You see all these little black things. Those are all bacteria. We should never see that. And then the other thing is we take that urine and we put it on this plate that has food in it for bacteria. And if there's bacteria there, you'll see these little white things. These are bacterial colonies growing. You should never see that. This plate should look just pink with nothing on it. But if you see these little circles, big ones, small ones, 
those are bacterial colonies growing. So the doctor will put little antibiotic strips around all these things and different antibiotics, Keflex, cephalosporins, penicillin, whatever, a whole bunch of different antibiotics, and we'll see which ones kill the colony. And the ones that kill the colony, we know we can offer to our patient. Problem is this takes three, four days to grow. So the doctor, if they suspect a urinary tract infection, will put you on an antibiotic even without knowing the result. And then three, four days later, we'll change the antibiotic if they get a different result from here. Hopefully they were right and the antibiotic they put you on will kill the colony. Now, what diseases affect the kidney? The most prevalent one in the world and the one that causes disease in half the kidney patients in the US and on the planet is diabetes. So God sent Adam and Eve out of the garden because of the apple. Apples have carbs and carbs are evil. That's not the problem in the kidney. Yes, diabetes is a sugar problem in the blood. Your blood sugar goes up. But what diabetes does to the kidney is something very different totally different concept. Diabetes destroys the blood vessels in your body. And then not just the blood vessels to the kidney, but elsewhere. So this is a normal blood vessel here. And this is what diabetes does to it. You get all this yellow fatty substance here. You can get blood clots occurring here. What happens is the, the diameter of this blood vessel is getting narrower and narrower. So the blood flow to your tissues decreases, the kidney, so your kidney doesn't work as well. Brain, you can get a stroke. If this occurs in the arteries around your heart, you can have a heart attack. So diabetes ruins your blood vessels. The second thing it does to the kidney is it ruins the filters. This is one filter shown. It's a microscopic view of a filter. This is a diabetic filter. Look at it. It's filled with all this junk and it's not gonna filter. Look how nice this is. Everything's open. This thing's all filled with this purple junk. It takes 18 years to go from here to here. So typically people have diabetes for 15 to 18 years. Once it reaches this stage, they're going to need dialysis. This thing is not filtering. Okay, so, so diabetes is the most common kidney disease in the world. And if we could solve diabetes, we would empty out half the dialysis units. And there are a number of pharmaceutical companies working on multiple, multiple treatments for diabetes. This is another common disease, especially in Asia. It's called IgA nephropathy. It typically presents, the patient will come in, say I was fine on the weekend and Monday morning I went to pee and my urine came out red, orange. I was peeing blood. Sometimes it occurs after what feels like a cold. So you'll be fine. And Sunday, you get the nose sniffles, a little bit of a fever. And then Monday morning, you go to pee and it's all red. That's how IJ nephropathy typically presents after cold-like symptoms. And then what looks like bloody urine. This is not due to beets. This is real blood in the urine. This disease also affects the filter, but it's because your body starts to attack your filters with what's called IgA. IgA is a short form for a type of what we call antibodies. And you can actually see this IgA in this picture in the filter. It should never be there. That you should never see this green in a normal kidney. If we see that, it's IgA nephropathy. And these patients can continue to pee blood. Every time they pee, they pee blood. So we have to check and make sure they don't get anemic. And their kidney filtration can decline. It can decline to the point where they need dialysis. So this is another disease of the filter. People can also get kidney stones. These are real stones shown on the right here. There's an abnormality in calcium handling in the kidney, for example. And you can see in this cartoon, the stone can form in the kidney here. It can stay in the kidney but sometimes it breaks off and starts coming down here. If it's bigger than this opening and can't get through, you're gonna experience the worst pain a human being can experience worse than labor. 
It's in the back, starts in the in your back, upper back, and it travels down into your groin, goes around into the front of the groin, and patients are screaming with pain. Um, and you can throw up. It's it's just very severe pain, and it can be pulsating pain because the kidney is is actually trying to push this stone out, and it pulses. You know this with different pressure to get it out, but it can't get out. So they go to the hospital, the doctor does some imaging, sees the stone, and first will give you morphine to just, you know, totally put you at ease and stop the pain. Then the doctor has to decide what to do. If it's blocking this tube and the urine can't get out, they'll actually put a tube into the kidney here through from your abdomen straight through into the kidney and it'll let the urine come out at least through the tube if it's blocking it. Um, sometimes the block can also cause an infection behind it, so they can have a urinary tract infection. Sometimes the stone can scrape against the wall and people will come in with bloody urine in addition to the pain. Kidney stones, 15 million Americans every year, very common. Many types of kidney stones. They now have multiple ways of getting rid of these. They can put you into a, um, a machine that has ultrasound waves that they can actually target right into the kidney, right at the stone and the ultrasound waves pulverize it while you're standing there. You don't feel anything. They're going inside your body, aimed at the stone and turn it into dust. And then you just pee out the little pieces. Um, the other way they can do it is if it's too big to do it that way, they actually can go in through the side or they can go up from your, your urethra all the way up to the kidney with a laser and blast it with a laser. This is all looked after by urologists, not nephrologists. Nephrologist tries to figure out why you're prone to getting stones. So the nephrologist will do a lot of blood and urine tests to figure out whether you have a genetic abnormality that makes you predisposed to stones and also what treatment you should be on. The urologist, his role is to get rid of the stone if it won't come out. And they have multiple, multiple new techniques now. This is another disease of the kidney. It's a genetic disease. It's passed down from one generation to the next. You only have to have one parent with it, not both. And it's called polycystic kidney disease. And this is what the kidneys look like. They look like they have all these blebs coming out. The kidneys are big, all these blebs all over the place. And this is often diagnosed in your 40s people tend to have these things grow as they age. You can, the kidneys can look, let's say, quite normal in your 20s, 30s. They start to get worse and worse. Different people progress at different rates. Some people have this and are perfectly fine. Others progress to the point where they need dialysis. Each person's different. Even people in the same family, even people in the same family, you can have a brother and sister. The brother can have this, and have totally normal creatinine and kidney function. The sister, the x-rays look the same, and yet she's on dialysis. And the reason for that is there are other genes that we have that can either protect you or make you worse. Even if you have the same mutation, there are other genes that you have that are protecting genes or worsening genes. So everybody's different, unless you're a twin. But this causes about five to 10% of patients on dialysis, it's very common, very common. There are some newer treatments for this that we offer, but we don't have a definitive treatment for it yet. And we also don't know of those patients who get it, who will go on to need dialysis. We don't wanna put everybody with this on the drugs. So it's, it's a problem because we can't predict in the future who will actually need the pill. It's another problem with insurance because let's say the parents have it. One of the parents has it. They get their kids tested. They're 15 years old. Their kidney function is completely normal. The x-rays don't show any of this. But let's say uh, Timmy, who's 14 years old, has the mutation. So we know with cer certainty Timmy has the disease or at least the propensity to get it, but he doesn't have anything yet. What do you do with his insurance? If you tell the insurance company, my son has, or let's say when he's 25 or six and needs his own insurance, 
that he has polycystic kidney disease mutation, the insurance company may deny insurance because he has a precondition already. So a lot of people cover it up, even though they know they have the mutation, they keep it quiet. They say there's nothing wrong with them and that way they can get their insurance. So it's one of the diseases that creates a problem with insurance. This is another disease of the filter. It's called lupus. You may have heard of it. It tends to occur in young women. And this is a disease where you attack not just the kidney, but you attack your heart, you attack your organs. The body attacks itself, starts destroying itself. It's called lupus. And the kidney is one of the um, organs that's affected too. Again, it's the filter. This is a normal filter below. Look at this filter. A pathologist and nephrologist recognizes that this filter has a ton of cells in it. Or what we call in medicine, there's inflammation. There's a lot of inflammatory cells here. And again, the filter is getting all clogged with all these cells and inflammation, and it's not going to work normally. So lupus is one, another cause of if it gets bad enough needing dialysis where you, you're not filtering normally. This little girl has red cheeks. This is what we call a butterfly rash. This is not from the sun, but it's because she has a lot of inflammation in her skin here. That's why it's so red. They also can be very sensitive to the sun. She can lose her hair. She can also attack her joints. A lot of them have different types of arthritis, not uncommonly. They can attack the brain. The brain can get inflamed, liver, basically virtually any organ in lupus can get inflamed. Cancer of the kidney, not a common cancer. And we have many ways of dealing with this also. If it's in a part of the kidney that's isolated and it's a certain size, the doctor can just take out part of the kidney here and leave the rest. The doctors always try to save kidney function. So the worst approach, sometimes you don't have a choice, is to take out the whole kidney. Then you've got 50% of your kidney function there. So um, urologists try to spare the remaining tissue if possible, but at the same time, they don't want to have recurrence. So it, it, there's a lot of work that has to be done to, to make a decision. Plus you can have a mass in your kidney and it may be benign, or it may be a very slow growing tumor. And all these things require different approaches and different analysis. The another way they can do it is to radio ablate it. They put a probe here and they actually fry the tissue with radio waves that heat up the uh, abnormal growth here and destroy it while leaving the rest of the tissue intact. This is, you can see here, this is what you see on a CAT scan. This is a normal kidney here, and this is the kidney with the cancer in it. Now, if we look at the United States now and just say, how many patients are on dialysis and what's the turnover? In the United States today, there's about 650,000 human beings on dialysis. Every year, there's about 100,000 new patients that go on dialysis and about 100,000 patients that pass away. So there's about 650 total. Turns out there's also about 100, maybe a little more, thousand patients in the US waiting for a kidney transplant. So if you just remember 100, 100, 100, that's the easy way to remember. And our goal in nephrology is to get this number down. And in fact, it seems to be slowing down. The number of new people going on to dialysis is slowing down. Remember, these would be people who are CKD stage five. Once it gets there, worse than that, they, they need some sort of kidney replacement therapy. Now, if you look at the deaths in the United States from kidney disease, it's amazingly high compared to other cancers. Every year, about 34,000 people die from uh, prostate cancer. About 43,000 die from breast cancer. Kidney, 100,000. Kidney is two and a half times. Kidney disease is two and a half times breast cancer. You'd never know it. We just don't have the public awareness. We don't have the funding campaigns. We don't have the same amount of money that cancer gets for research. Uh, it's just a disease that tends to be ignored socially in the United States. 
And so it's quite amazing how prevalent it is. The only cancer that's more prevalent as far as causing deaths, this is in thousands, by the way, you multiply this by a thousand, this is a hundred thousand, multiply each of these by a thousand. So there's 135,000 people each year dying from lung cancer. It's the only cancer that's higher than kidney disease. This, this data is like not, public is just not aware of this. So what do we do when a patient needs what we call renal replacement therapy? That means that the function of the kidney is not sufficient to control the chemistry of blood. Well, we have what's called hemodialysis, which is, was invented in 1942 by a physician in the Netherlands during World War II when the Nazis had invaded uh, the Netherlands. He was working in a very small hospital and worked out uh, what dialysis, hemodialysis was. And basically what we do is we take the blood uh, out of the patient. It's pumped. This is just a pump. It, and then it goes into this thing. This is the nuts and bolts of the machine. The rest of it is just um, dials and, and it measures pumps and pressures. But this is what's doing the dialysis, this thing. It's called a dialyzer. And what it is, it has thousands of little tubes in here so the blood comes in and gets distributed into the thousands of little tubes. They're like straws. They're all attached at the bottom, but they break up into separate units. And then they all get reattached at the top. So the blood goes in the center of the straws. And on the outside is a, so this is the blood coming in and the blood leaving. This is the other component of the dialyzer. We have a solution coming into the outside of the straws and then leaves and goes into the floor. So there's a loose solution coming in and out continuously. And the blood is going through the center of those little straws and comes out the top. And what happens is substances cross the straw into the outside fluid. So let's say your potassium in your blood is something we wanna remove. We'll make the outside solution very low in potassium and potassium will cross from your blood into the outside solution and then it just goes into the floor. So that's how we get rid of potassium. And we can get rid of things or we can add things to your blood. And this is done for three to three and a half hours, three times a week. Now, that's the minimum needed. This doesn't replace your kidneys. Your kidneys are working 24 seven. They never know what a vacation is. They never know what sleeping is. They never get tired. They're working your whole life from the time you're born till the end. So the three and a half hours, three times a week cannot replace what the kidneys are doing seven days a week, 24 hours a day, but it's sufficient to control your blood chemistry and keep you healthy. But as you can imagine, it's much more harsh on the system because it's only done three times a week. It's not being done throughout the day. A more gentle way of doing things is what's called peritoneal dialysis, where a catheter is put into the peritoneal cavity. This was in came to the fore in the late 70s. There's a cavity in your abdomen called the peritoneal cavity. Normally it's collapsed, you can't see it, but it's like a balloon. You can put fluid into it and it expands. And you can actually get dialysis occurring across the normal peritoneal membrane. We don't use a dialyzer, we're taking advantage of this membrane that's actually in all of us. And so if you put fluid in here, you can actually draw out potassium, let's say from your blood into this fluid. So what happens is the fluid is put in, it's left in for two hours, potassium will accumulate in the fluid and then it's drained into, the, into a bag and discarded. And we do this five times, usually throughout a night because the patients can do this while they're sleeping. And then they go about their business during the day. You do this every day. It depends if you have kidney function left. If you have kidney function left, the doctor may give you a day off or may cut back on the number of times you have to do this at night. It's called residual renal function. People with more residual renal function don't need as much dialysis. So some people who go on dialysis still have some kidney function left. So not everybody who goes on dialysis stops peeing. Some people have 10 to 15% of their kidney function left, 
not enough to sustain normal chemistry. So we have to supplant that with dialysis. But if someone does have normal kidney function left, that's better because it means the kidney is still doing something. And it means that we don't have to treat them as much. We can modulate our treatment. The third form of treatment is a kidney transplant. A kidney transplant is great because you get a, a, norm, a kidney, which does all the things a kidney should do, except that you have to take what are called immunosuppressive drugs because we must prevent the kidney from being rejected. UCLA is working on protocols that maybe one day we'll get, be able to get people off their immunosuppressives altogether. We're also working on transplanting HIV positive kidneys, hepatitis positive kidneys, and now COVID-19 positive kidneys to increase the number of kidneys uh, in our transplanted pool. If you don't accept a kidney from a living person, you have to receive it from a deceased person. And there's about 15,000 patients or so in, Cal in Los Angeles area now waiting for a deceased kidney on the waiting list. Sometimes they're on the waiting list for 10 years in Los Angeles waiting for a kidney. So it's far better to get a kidney from a living person. It's called a living donor. And what we do is we recommend to all patients who go on dialysis to also get involved with the transplant program at the same time after they've started dialysis so they can hopefully get a transplanted kidney and don't have to remain on dialysis. And so in order to get the living donor, you have to also talk to people and get the names of people who are wishing to donate a kidney to you. Now, these don't have to be relatives. They can be friends. They don't have to be related to you and they don't have to be a perfect match. We have ways now of transplanting ABO, incompatible kidneys, uh, and all sorts of uh, drugs now to be able to handle mismatched kidneys and also other things that can occur. So we recommend to anyone who has CKD stage three or four even, well before they need dialysis, that if things aren't looking good to start thinking of a transplant and to start thinking of people that might be uh, interested in donating. The more people, the better, because most of the donors we reject. In fact, we have about eight or 900 donors a year at UCLA coming to our transplant clinic for evaluation who are willing to donate, but they're turned down. They're not acceptable as a donor. Oftentimes they have diseases they didn't even know about. We do a very rigorous physical and biochemical analysis and psychological on the donors and oftentimes they're rejected either because they have abnormal blood tests they didn't know about or they have some disease in an organ they didn't know about or for psychological reasons we assess them and we determine that they're not they're not good psychological candidates for donation some people um, you know get very depressed or have other behavioral abnormalities after donation so um, they're fine before but not after the donation um, so we, we have to make sure that psych, in addition to the physical, that psychologically uh, they'll be capable of donating. We have very strict criteria in our program for, for accepting donors. And of the eight or 900 that we, we analyze a year, we might accept 100 or 150. Now, last year, UCLA did around 427 transplants, and it was and the most in California, in addition to the fact that uh, we have uh, the best results as far as how the kidney is doing in California, and we're uh, third in the, in the entire United States, at least last year, as far as outcomes. So we don't look, the number is one thing, and that's very nice, but more importantly is, are those kidneys functioning at a year? Are they functioning at five years? And how do we compare with the rest of the country? So I think with that, I'll stop tonight's talk. And if anyone has any questions, I'd be glad to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much for, for your attention. Um, this is uh, Joe. Oh, hi, Joe. How question. are you? Pretty good. Um, 
in the beginning, you talked about uh, salt and water, and you went through the salt in, in a lot of detail. What what part of the water is, is water bad for you or good for you? I, I didn't pick up on. Yes, yes, that's a very water. good question. So, so um, the way salt and water affect your blood pressure is the following. If you think of blood pressure, first of all, what are we actually measuring? We're measuring the pressure that's inside your blood vessels. We're not measuring pressure in the tissue in your arms or organs. So it's what, what we're trying to address is what is the pressure inside your blood vessels, which you can think of as long tubes. So think of what might increase the pressure. Well, if we increase the amount of fluid in that volume, we will increase the pressure inside. So both salt and water increase the amount of fluid inside your blood vessels. That's why the pressure goes up. Now fluid or water, you can, it's sort of clear. Why does salt do it? It's because salt makes your body retain fluid, but it's the fluid itself increasing excessively inside the blood vessels that causes the pressure to go up. Now, when you drink water, it doesn't all go into your blood vessels. It gets distributed inside the blood vessel. Actually only a small percentage of the water you drink stays in your blood. Most of it's outside the blood vessels and doesn't do anything to your blood pressure. It turns out though, the more salt you eat, the more of the water you drink stays in your blood vessels. So it's not the water per se. You can drink a lot of water and you don't get into trouble because first of all, your kidney, if it's normal, will get rid of the water. So you never have to worry about it. People can drink up to 10 liters a day and it'll never stay anywhere in your body because the kidney just pees it out. But if you have a kidney problem so that it can't get rid of the water, then that water will stay in your body. But if it's pure water, just tap water, a very small amount of it, even if it does stay in your body, will go in the blood vessels. So it, it's not a problem as far as high blood pressure. But if you add to that a lot of salt that you eat, salty food, or you add salt, then of the amount of water you're drinking and assuming your kidney can't get rid of it, it will stay in your blood vessels to a greater extent and will contribute to raising the pressure. But a normal person who drinks water who has normal kidney function can drink many, many glasses of water a day and you just pee it out. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, we get that asked a lot. How much water should I drink? Is water good for me? Will water help my kidneys? I read that if I run, I have to drink a certain amount of water. These are questions we get asked every day of the week. And the bottom line is there's no answer. The body will recognize whatever you drink and we'll pee it out. So you can drink seven glasses of water a day think, thinking you're doing something. And all you're going to be doing is making the kidney have to get rid of more water. So you're taking this nice, beautiful Perrier water you drank, uh, or whatever it is, and thinking Lake Arrowhead water, thinking you're doing something to your body. And it's all going to end up in the toilet. So basically, input and output are equal if your kidneys are normal. And so there isn't really a good answer as to how much water you should drink. Now, if you're running and you're sweating a lot or you have severe diarrhea or you're vomiting and you lose a lot of water, you must replace it. But I'm talking about driving the system where you're not dehydrated and you're just drinking and you're drinking lots of water. There's no reason for that. But you have to drink a certain amount to prevent dehydration especially if you're in a hot climate or you're an athlete. Any other questions at all or things that weren't clear? Okay, well, thank you very much for listening. And uh, if you have any questions or things you didn't want to ask in public, uh, please email Leslie and she'll pass the uh, information on to me and I'll get, I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Thanks again.